Okay, well, it's good to be together again to study the Word of God. I'd like you to turn, please, to Ruth chapter 2, and I'm going to read the first 12 verses, and we're going to be learning and considering the field of Boaz uh, this morning. So chapter 2 and verses 1 through 12. It says, and Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabitess, said unto Naomi, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz, unto his servant that was set over the reapers, whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, it is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men? that they shall not touch thee. And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me, all that thou hast done unto th thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust." And then I want to just read one verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9 that will have a bearing on how we're going to look at this passage together uh, this morning. Verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 3, uh, speaking concerning the church, he says, We're laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. And again, God will bless that reading of his word to us uh, this morning. So we're thinking about the field of Boaz, and we're going to see a tremendous contrast because we've come from chapter one, and chapter one has been about famine, and chapter two is going to be about fullness and food and fellowship. It's, it's a tremendous contrast between chapter one and the famine conditions and chapter two and the fullness. We're going from the battlefields of Judges now into the barley fields of Boaz. Uh, from emptiness in chapter one, and if you remember uh, the testimony of Naomi in verse 21 of chapter one, I went out full, the Lord hath brought me home again empty. So we're going from the emptiness of chapter one into the fullness of chapter two, from barrenness to fruitfulness of this field. Also going to notice that Boaz is the dominant, or we might say the preeminent person from now on. He's going to be mentioned 10 times in this chapter and 19 times in the remainder of the book. So 10 of the 19 mentions are in this chapter. Interestingly enough, too, 
uh, of the names we've had so far, we've had six. If you remember, there was Abimelech and there's Naomi, and then there's the two sons and the two daughters-in-law. That gives us a total of six people that have been mentioned so far. And this is the seventh man, the seventh one mentioned. Isn't that interesting? Uh, seven being the number of perfection and completeness. And of course, we're going to see in Boaz a type of Christ, the perfect man. And so just, to, just again, how scripture just works and fits so beautifully together, even down to biblical numerology. The seventh person, person mentioned by name in the book is that blessed man. And so as we consider this, we're going to see that this seventh person in the book is the solution to all the problems that we saw in chapter one. He is going to be the answer. And of course, remember years ago, a young man converted drug addict, and he used to walk around with his guitar, and he, he had one song he used to sing, and it was this, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there's no other. Jesus is the way. And of course, that seventh man is the answer to society's problems, to the world's problems. He is the answer. And so we're certainly going to see this. And so Boaz is revealed in this chapter as a mighty man of wealth, a mighty man of valor, the owner of the field, the lord of the harvest, the furnisher of the table, the redeemer, the kinsman redeemer, and the man from the house of bread. <laughs> and of course, we're, we're going to look at all those things in detail. But I just wanted to just say that this is, this is a tremendous chapter in which uh, the preeminent person is Boaz. And of course, as we think of the one who should always be preeminent in our thoughts, Christ preeminent in all things. And so, certainly he is in this chapter. Ruth in the whole book is mentioned 12 times by name, whereas Boaz mentioned 19 times. And so even though we call it the book of Ruth, really the preeminent person that's to be considered is Boaz. There's lots of unnamed people in the chapter too. There are reapers, there are servants, there are maidens, but they all remain unnamed. God wants us to focus on Boaz, uh, this, this man who is a beautiful picture of Christ, and then we're going to focus a little bit on his bride, this Gentile woman who is brought into a place of great grace and favor. The previous chapter covered 10 years. This chapter deals with one eventful day. And so it's kind of interesting how, just as we think of the time span, 10 years in chapter one, uh, in 22 verses, uh, we come into this chapter, uh, 23 verses, and it's all in one very eventful day. Of course, there was great rejoicing in a sense at the end of chapter one, when Ruth got back into the land and with Naomi. She, uh, or Naomi came back into the land. But there's even greater cause for rejoicing when Ruth got to the field. And we're going to kind of emphasize that. Uh, this field is going to be quite a significant place. Now, the reason I mentioned uh, 1 Corinthians 3, as we know, when it comes to studying the Bible, there's one application, uh, sorry, there's one interpretation of any passage, but there are many applications, okay? So the, we don't want to lose sight of the main story. The main story is a true story that we want to think about uh, the experience uh, of this Moabitess woman and how she found grace and favor. And that's the main story. And it's, it's the, how you interpret the text, just uh, by explaining it uh, in its context, but by way of application, there's many applications to this chapter. One, of course, is the gospel application that uh, that uh, Boaz is the kinsman redeemer. And we're going to see that. We're going to focus on that, that he, uh, particularly when we get to chapter three, uh, we'll see that he is indeed uh, the one uh, that pictures the Lord Jesus, who became our kinsman in order to redeem our souls uh, and so certainly we, we don't want to forget the gospel application. And we're going to see this Gentile who was once afar off being brought near. And so, so many beautiful gospel pictures. But the other application, the one that I want to focus on more as we consider this chapter, is 
concerning the local assembly, because the reason I read from 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9, and he's talking about the believers uh, in the assembly in Corinth, and he's talking them, about them being God's husbandry and God's building. And the word husbandry in the King James literally means God's cultivated field. And the local assembly is God's cultivated field. And it's the place where, where fruit for God is to be produced in that context of the local assembly. And so we're going to at least consider uh, some thoughts about the local assembly uh, as we consider the experience uh, that Ruth has in this field. So we're not going to ignore the, the main uh, interpretation, but we are going to also consider some application as we go. So beginning in verse one, it says, Naomi had a kinsman. Now, all the way through this chapter, we're going to see the, the and chapter three, the word kinsman is going to be used quite frequently. It's going to be used in verse 20. Uh, at the end of verse 20 of chapter two, it says, the man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. And then we're going to see it quite frequently in chapter three, uh, particularly verse 12. And now uh, it is true. This is chapter three, verse 12, that I am thy near kinsman, howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. And verse 13 mentioned several times, goes into chapter 14 several times. And the word kinsman in all the rest of the book, apart from this first reference, is, is that word goal, goel, uh, which is the, the, that technical term that means a kinsman redeemer. We'll explain more about it as we get there. But just to say that this first reference to kinsman is a much more general term. It just means uh, an acquaintance or friend or a relation, but it's not the specific name goel uh, that is significant as a kinsman redeemer. But, but the idea here is that Naomi did have a kinsman of her husband. Now, it would seem that she had probably forgotten about this relative or certainly not given him any thought because at the end of the chapter, she's kind of a bit shocked uh, that Ruth ends up in that field and it begins to dawn on her that he is really a kinsman redeemer. But she clearly, when she came back, she hadn't thought much about Boaz. So he's an acquaintance or friend of Naomi uh, through her husband, uh, a relation, because it's clear that he's of the family of Elimelech. Uh, we know that. Uh, it says Naomi was, had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. By the way, it begins with a sharp contrast, doesn't it? So you've got Naomi, this poor widow, and now there's this kinsman that she's kind of forgotten about or certainly not given a lot of thought to. And in contrast to her poverty, this poor widow, there's this kinsman. And it says he was a mighty man of wealth, somebody who was in excellent standing uh, in Bethlehem, whose name would carry a certain weight with it an authority among the neighbors. Because the term uh, that's used here, mighty man of wealth, it's the exact same term that's translated elsewhere frequently in, in the Old Testament as mighty man of valor. It's the very same phrase, mighty man of wealth or mighty man of valor. And there's some thought that perhaps, you remember, this is the days of the book of Judges, that perhaps uh, this man had been involved in some of the conflicts in the book of Judges, and maybe that's where some of his wealth came from, uh, because he was a warrior, mighty man of valor. Uh, that's, that term is used in that way. And so perhaps he had come into some wealth, some of the spoils of battle uh, that had gave him wealth uh, to be able to, uh, in a sense, furnish this, this field and uh, because of uh, his victory in battle. And of course, we're reminded, aren't we, that the Lord Jesus, our kinsman redeemer, fought a great battle for us on Golgotha uh, when he died on Calvary's cross for us so that we could come into the great riches and the great blessings of being part of his cultivated field. Aren't we glad for the great battle that uh, he fought on our behalf? So Boaz, while obviously a man of means and substance, uh, owing a considerable property 
a man of wealth and virtue, reputation and character, a force of influence and for good in his locality, and an employer, clearly we're going to see, highly respected by those who labored for him in his harvest field, as we will see in these subsequent verses. And what, again, a, a perfect foreshadowing to us of Christ, the great kinsman redeemer, someone of wealth, though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty we might be made rich, uh, one of virtue, uh, that sinless, spotless, holy son of God, a man of force and influence, uh, could have called 12 legions of angels, certainly so many beautiful pictures here. Interesting enough, just a good reminder that 10 years before, Naomi and her family made a choice. And it was a choice made in difficult times. Sometimes we make decisions in times of crisis, and sometimes they're not the best decisions. In a time of difficulty, it, it's, there's a great temptation to abandon ship, uh, to get out. And so in a time of famine, they, they made a choice. Uh, they made a choice to la leave the house of bread, as we considered last time. They didn't have to make that choice, clearly, because we don't read of anybody in Bethlehem perishing from hunger, even during the famine. They're all still there. And, and we see, at least in the case of Boaz, that he prospered even during those 10 years and was far more blessed than Naomi's family. And we certainly need to pray for the Lord to help us, because sometimes when we get in difficulties, uh, we, we feel the urgency to make a decision. And sometimes we make wrong decisions. And sometimes it, it can be an impoverishing decision. And we can justify wrong choices because of the difficult circumstances. But God certainly preserved those of Bethlehem and prospered them when they stayed in the place of God's appointment for them. Now, the name Boaz, who we're going to be thinking a lot about, means strength. In him is strength. That's the, the meaning of the term. In fact, it's even used for two of the pillars that were in Solomon's temple. If you look at Second Chronicles just for a moment, uh, you will see that when Solomon uh, built the temple, that in, in Second Chronicles 3, verse 17, he built two uh, beautiful pillars. And it says, verse 17, he reared up the pillars before the temple, one on the right hand and the other on the left, and called the name of that on the right hand, Jachin, and the name of that on the left, Boaz. Of course, um, Jachin, is the idea of he will establish and Boaz in him is strength. And of course, isn't it wonderful yeah, that our Boaz in him is strength. And by the way, in our Boaz, that's where we get our strength from, isn't it? Uh, I can do all things through Christ, which Boaz is me, which strengthens me. Isn't that wonderful to realize that? He is our strength. He's the one, by the way, that is our Jacob as well. He's the one who establishes us, but he also is the one who strengthens us. So his name means strength. And we think of the strength of the Lord Jesus so strong that he holds the world together with the word of his mouth. Isn't that amazing? I mean, the fact that we're not uh, just kind of evaporating. Uh, at this moment in time is because he, the one in whom is strength, is holding everything together by the word of his mouth. So verse 2, it says, Ruth the Moabite has said unto Naomi, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whom sight I might, I shall find grace. And he said unto her, go, my daughter. Note Ruth's eagerness to work in the field to support her mother-in-law. Most likely, uh, her mother-in-law, Naomi, was too old for the back-breaking work of gleaning. And so she, she asked permission. She's 
put herself under the authority of her mother-in-law and she's asking her permission to go and glean in the field. Whether the Moabitess was fully aware of it or not, she was about to avail herself of a provision of an ancient Mosaic law which gave certain rights to the poor and to the stranger. Even under law, the Old Testament law, there were instances of grace and his provision for those who were poor and destitute. And by the way, isn't God's wisdom marvelous? We'll, we'll look at the commands in a moment uh, from Leviticus and from Deuteronomy. But you think of God's way of dealing with helping the poor. It commanded the farmers to have a generous heart. It commanded the poor to be active and work for their food and a way for them to provide for their own needs with dignity rather than just getting a handout. So, so God's provision, it's not a, a government handout. It, it's this plan where this social assistance program that he set up in Israel, the farmers were not to completely harvest their fields. They were to leave the corners uh, for the gleaners. Uh, and then the poor and needy could come and glean the remnants of the field and have the dignity of working for their own bread rather than just the idea of being given handouts. Let's look at the passages concerned. Uh, book of Leviticus to begin with, just a couple of portions in Leviticus, and then one in Deuteronomy that will linger a little bit longer on. Leviticus 19 and verse 9. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of the field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of the harvest. Okay, so you've got, you've got to leave something. Leave something behind. Leviticus chapter 23, and again, verse 22. And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. And then the more definitive passage is in Deuteronomy 24. And verse 19 through 21. And I want you to notice three times in this little section, we're going to have a repeated phrase that it's for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. And certainly Ruth, she qualifies on two counts. She's certainly a stranger. Uh, she's not from these parts. She's a Moabitess, and she's a widow. And so verse 19, when thou cuttest down thine harvest, in thy field, and hast forgot a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hands. When thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, Thou shalt not glean it afterwards. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command thee to do this thing. And so here's Ruth. And out of two, two out of the three uh, provision uh, reasons for this provision, uh, she qualified. She's a stranger. And she's a widow. Tragically, with so many of the laws in Israel, not all farmers did this. God intended them to. He gave the right to glean in the harvest fields. And uh, that they should leave the corners and all the rest of it. But hard-hearted farmers and reapers threw obstacles in the way of the poor, and at times even forbade their gleanings altogether. And so that's why Ruth says, uh, as she goes uh, to the field, she says, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. 
So she was looking for someone, some Jewish farmer that would recognize that they were once bondmen in the land of Egypt and understand something of the grace of God and leave something for the poor. So she's, she's looking to find grace. And so she goes, and again, we see something of the noble character of Ruth consulting with her mother-in-law before going to glean. They were poor. They had returned from Moab empty. They needed provision somehow. Naomi, too old for that kind of backbreaking work. Ruth is the one who wants to look after her mother-in-law and her own needs by going to glean in the fields. When Ruth set out that morning to glean in the fields, she was looking for someone who would show her grace. And notice there's a great emphasis of grace in this chapter. Look at verse 10. Then she fell on her face and, and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And then verse 13. Then she said, Let me find favor. That's the same idea of the word grace in thy sight. So not only did she find grace, she actually asked that she might find more grace. She's, she's looking for someone who will not only give her grace, but grace upon grace. Do we know anybody like that? <laughs> oh, we surely do, don't we? Our Boaz is one who has given us the exceeding riches of his grace. And grace upon grace. Oh, how grateful we should be to the one who has shown such favor to us. So verse 3, she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. In other words, she didn't know this. It was what I would have called uh, in the notes of my Bible, a, a happy happenstance. <laughs> uh, her hap was. And by the way, the word hap and the word light in this verse, verse three, her hap was to light on a part of the field. They're, they're different Hebrew words, but they're from the same root word. And they carry a very similar meaning. Literally, we could translate this phrase, her chance chanced upon the field of Boaz. But we don't believe in chance, do we? We believe in what we call the doctrine of divine providence. Isn't that wonderful? In the providence of God, in all the fields of Bethlehem, she happened <laughs> to set her feet in the feet of Boaz. And could we suggest that not only is this divine providence, could we suggest that the spirit of God will always guide those whose hearts are right? One thing we see here is that Ruth is in a right condition. She's respectful to her mother-in-law. She's wanting to do the right thing. And, and as she's seeking to do the right thing, the spirit of God, even though she's not even aware of it, in his providence, directs her to the very spot where she's going to find grace upon grace. And as we look back over our lives, I think all of us, if we're really honest, we can see something of the divine providence in our lives. And it's usually one of those things you see looking back. You see it in the story of Joseph, just the providence of God at every twist and turn. And uh, it's a wonderful thing to meditate on the providence of God. And so this happy happenstance, she ends up in this particular field. And who would have imagined the far-reaching effects of Ruth happening on the field of Boaz? It would even affect the very genealogy of the Messiah himself. What an amazing thing to think about. One thing we learn about Boaz, too, is he was obedient to Scripture to leave the corners of the field for the gleaners. He was obedient to the word of God in every way. He, he, he certainly 
showed great kindness to the gleaners. He didn't treat them like some farmers who tried to harass them and drive them away. <clears throat> Sometimes this passage has been used of pictures of new converts because we're going to see in this chapter, Ruth is a convert and a new convert and she's gleaning in the fields. And I think Brother Miller mentioned maybe this morning, if I remember rightly, about in the olden days in Scotland, when two believers met each other, they would ask the question, where hast thou been gleaning this morning? And the idea of gleaning on the pages of scripture and uh, kind of uh, getting a harvest in the scriptures. And certainly it's a lovely picture of a new convert gleaning in the scriptures there for our enjoyment, for our spiritual feeding and for our blessing. But we said we wanted to look at it too as an assembly, as a cultivated field. And how a young believer can be a, a spiritual addition and a help to an assembly. And so she goes into this field and we're going to see some of the things that she's going to learn there. What's remarkable and special about this particular field, and we have to keep this in our minds right at the beginning, is uh, what what marks this this field and makes it as such a special field is it's the owner is Boaz. That's that marks out the attractiveness of the field. Boaz is the one who owns it, and it makes it an attractive place to be. And as we gather in the local assembly, it's good to remember, isn't it, that what makes it an attractive place is it's the place where he is, where two or three are gathered in his name there he is in the midst and he's the one that makes the field you see there are many people that get together in social gatherings and clubs i was at a, a, a car show doing some evangelism recently and i i happened to share the gospel with a group of people who were in the british car club and they've got their mgs and their triumphs and all these things and of course, when uh, they heard I was an Englishman, they invited me to join, even though I don't have an English car. And they wanted me to be part of their group. And there are so many groups out of there where we could spend our time. But what marks out the assembly is different from any other gathering is that the Lord Jesus is the one who is the gathering center. It's him that draws us together, him that makes the field attractive. And we see something in verse four of the atmosphere in this field, that there's beautiful, respectful relationships between uh, those in the field. Notice, behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered him, the Lord bless thee. You see the lovely courtesy? Uh, this, this, this is the boss coming to the field. And, and yet his his conversation with the workers is this, the Lord be with thee. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, just such, such lovely courtesy, charming scene. And, and of course, it's responded with courtesy. They respond back, the Lord bless thee. And he clearly already has blessed him. And of course, isn't it nice that in the local assembly, we do need to use terms of affection for one another. Just like you see in the New Testament, our beloved brother, Paul, you know, uh, I, just, I just love the way they talk about one another with such, uh, with such charm, such courtesy, or how we need to address one another. We're saints, we're brethren, uh, with reverence. And of course, when we're speaking of our Boaz, or how we ought to use terms of absolute reverence. Yes, he is the Lord, Jesus Christ. And, and it's wonderful to come uh, and address him with terms of reverence. It shows us something of the heart and character of Boaz. His workers clearly loved him and had a good relationship with him. And he shows care and kindness to them. So often, a godly master will enjoy good industrial relations with those that he works with. And certainly we see this in verse 4. Uh, notice verse 5, then Boaz uh, then said Boaz unto the ser his servant that was set over the reapers, whose damsel is this? Notice not only is there an atmosphere in the field, there's accountability in the field. Because uh, there's, uh, this servant is expected to know who's there, who's working, what they're doing, what their name is, where they're from. 
And so there's some accountability in the field. And again, we marvel at the overruling providence of God. Not only did she go to the field of Boaz, but the day she went to the field of Boaz was a day when Boaz showed up in the field. Isn't that beautiful? The very day that she goes there, Boaz shows up in the field. This is the overruling providence of God. The Lord led Ruth to the field of Boaz, then led Boaz to visit his field while Ruth was there. And what wonderful condescension the mighty Boaz takes an interest in a poor, penniless, despised, weak, helpless stranger. Marvelous grace, matchless goodness, Boaz is interested in Ruth. And those of us that have come to know the Lord Jesus, we see a picture of his grace towards us. Why would he notice and care about me? You know, we often sing that great song, I wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Why would he, would he think about me? Why would he set his love on someone like me, a stranger and spiritually bankrupt? And yet he would show grace and take an interest, a personal interest in every one of us. Whose damsel is this? And the servant was who was set over the reapers, it tells us in verse 6, Anson said, it is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. So <laughs> notice verse 7 as well. She said, I pray you let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now, and she tarried a little in the house. So we notice some things. First of all, she's not presumptuous. Ruth is not presumptuous. When she, she goes to the field, she doesn't just say, well, I'm here to demand my rights. Doesn't it say in Leviticus 23 uh, that, you know, the poor and the stranger or Deuteronomy 24, uh, like, just give me my rights. There's no kind of sense of her demanding her rights. She comes in and she's not one bit presumptuous. She asks permission to, to be able to glean in the field of the servant who was set over the reapers. She said, I pray you, let me glean and gather. And so there's, there's this, this humble attitude as she comes into the field. Um, we notice, too, that the field is a place of activity. There are no spectators. There's no shirkers, just workers. The diversity, there's different ones, but they're all working in this field. And, of course, the local assemblies like that. It's not a place for spectators. It, it's not, Christianity is not a spectator sport. Uh, it's a place for, of activity. It's a place where each of us have a different responsibility, a different role, but we're all to work in his field uh, to make it a place of fruitfulness and blessing. So there's diversity in action. And so the supervisor reports to Boaz and he tells of Ruth's submissive attitude. There's, there's no sense of this is uh, her claiming her rights, but she's asking the right to gather in the field. And she continued, we read, from morning until evening. She's a hard worker, and she was working hard in the field. And it's interesting, isn't it? She was, she was under inspection. She was being observed the whole time by this supervisor, this unnamed servant. He's looking at what kind of job she did. And she was impressed. She left a good impression on him. He's impressed with her. And, and he was able to give a good report, report to, to Boaz. And it's good to remind ourselves, too, that we're also under inspection. We're being watched. We're being watched by others, but being, we're also being watched by the Lord. How are we working in the local assembly? Is our attitude good? Are we working hard? Are we serving in a way that is appropriate? Is a good report uh, reaching the ears of Boaz concerning us and our service? It's going to have a, an impact on how Boaz deals with this lady because of her hard work. She was a consistent hard worker. 
working hard, backbreaking work in the field. She's not idle. She's laboring ceaselessly since her arrival in the morning, except a little while that she had rested in the house. Now, again, we might want to talk about this, this house for a moment. Uh, it seems that in the harvest fields, uh, they, had, they would usually set up uh, some kind of hut or a tent, which provided welcome shelter for the laborers and shade for the heat of the sun, especially during mealtimes where they would take some refreshment. And so she's labored apart from uh, one time where she took shelter from perhaps the midday sun uh, from the heat. Interesting that this unnamed servant of Boaz is like another unnamed servant in Genesis 24 perhaps a representative or at least a picture of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in calling out a bride for the Redeemer. And certainly the, there's going to be a good report brought uh, to the potential bridegroom of this woman here. Notice, too, that this supervisor was very observant. And every assembly elder should be observant and take personal interest in the saints in the local assembly. Just as Boaz took an interest, who is this damsel, just as the servant was very observant, uh, so those in oversight, the idea of oversight means you're looking over the flock, you're watching for them, you're, you're checking on them. And so there certainly should be that idea of uh, paying attention and noticing how are the saints doing? in the field. Verse 8, then said Boaz unto Ruth, hearest thou not my daughter, go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Interesting how Boaz took the initiative. Grace, one thing that grace shows us is that God is the one who takes the first move to come to our aid. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God so loved the world, he gave his only son. So this idea is that God took the initiative. Isn't it wonderful that in this whole plan of redemption, it was God who took the initiative. He saw our plight and he, he condescends to men of low estate. This is very consent, condescending. The owner of the field actually takes the initiative and talks to this woman. And again, we, we marvel at that, 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 that the Lord would want our fellowship, isn't it? Don't you find it staggering? Uh, Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, we've been called into the fellowship of his son. And you think to yourself, why, why would the Lord Jesus want anything to do with someone like me? <laughs> that he actually would desire my fellowship, not just the Lord Jesus, but uh, John the Apostle, he, he, he just can't get over it when he talks about the fact that we've been called into fellowship with divine persons, uh, that, that we have fellowship with, with, with the Father and with his Son, and he wants us to enjoy that same fellowship, that we can, and then the communion of the Holy Ghost, that, that the amazing thing is that, that the, the, the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, actually wants fellowship with strangers like us and so he tells her don't go in any other field he, he's the one who first spoke to her uh, she wouldn't have dared to speak to a man especially uh, the strange uh, uh, th this lord of the harvest as a stranger what right did a widow and an alien have to address a great man like boaz yet he interrupted his conversation with his foreman to speak to a poor stranger gleaning in the field. Interesting that Ruth's first man, well, it ended up at a grave, her first man. <laughs> but the second man would bring her into a place of grace. <laughs> and our connection with the first man, Adam, where did that take us? It took us to a grave. But our connection with the the second man, the last Adam, where does that take us? It takes us into grace upon grace, a place of tremendous, and to a wedding, <laughs> uh, to, to ultimately to a wedding. Verse 9 says, let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap 
and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go into unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. So what is what is provided for Ruth in the field of Boaz? I want to suggest three things that are provided in this field. First thing is companionship. Notice in verse eight, it says, go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. And so you, you work along with my maidens. So there's that sense of brought into companionship amongst these young women. So she's not isolated. She's not this lonely widow working alone, but there's a companionship. And of course, when we come in to the local assembly, one of the wonderful things about the local assembly is it's a place of companionship. There's there's fellowship. There's there's that enjoyment of communion, not only with God, but with one another. There's companionship. And then in Boaz field, Ruth would find protection among the young the young men. They've been told not to touch her. Notice verse nine. It says, have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? No harassment. You're not going to get harassed there. The people are going to receive you. They're going to welcome you. It's not going to be a place. It's a place of protection. And it is a place of protection, a place, a safe place where sheep can safely graze. And so uh, it's a, it's, you'll find protection. And then it's a place where she would find refreshment in Boaz field. Notice, too, uh, that he says, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. And so it's a place where your thirst can be quenched. And so again, the local assembly should be a place that provides all of those things, genuine companionship, protection. And there is protection in fellowship, isn't there? When you're on your own, uh, it's very easy to be led astray. Uh, we need one another. We need that exaltation, that encouragement. It's a place of protection and we need a refreshment and it's a place where we should be able to come to the local assembly and go away refreshed spiritually refreshed that we've been with god's people under the sound of god's word and drinking of that life-giving water and of course it was a place where ultimately she'd find a husband in the field and certainly uh, that's a good place to find a life partner isn't it in in the local assembly too Notice her appreciation of being in the field. She wonders at being allowed to be there in verse 10. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? She's deeply moved by the cordiality of one whom she had never met before and she a stranger from moab and she she falls on her face in the harvest field prostrating herself in sincere gratitude before boaz and in reverence as before a superior her words of thankfulness to him they're almost on a par of the great words of her uh, conversion testimony in verse 16 and 17 of chapter one where uh, she says, uh, where you go, I'll go. Where you lodge, I'll lodge. Your people will be my people. This is this is a great, one of these great statements. And, you know, in, in one sense, we should look at it this way, that on the one hand, we're so thankful to be saved. It's a wonderful thing to be saved. But we're also, do we thank the Lord for the day that he brought us into fellowship in the local assembly? Do we, are we thankful for that? For, for what he's brought us into? the blessings that he's brought us into. Uh, and I, I think it's a wonderful thing. Why have I found grace in your eyes? And it's a mark of grace. It's that, that he's brought us into this fellowship, uh, which is so wonderful. It's interesting how Ruth's, on Ruth's mind, there's constantly this idea that she's a stranger, a Moabitess, not an Israelitess. She knew that on the basis of natural background, national background, she didn't belong. And, and that made the kindness shown to her all the more precious. 
And again, isn't it wonderful for us? You know, we think of who we are, Gentiles, once afar off. And yet now we've been brought in to this place of intimacy and, and, and into, into the, the assembly. What, what a wonderful thing. And we, we, we often should be using these words of gratitude. Once we were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in this world, but we that were once afar off have been brought near. Wondrous grace that has been shown to us. And so verse 11, Boaz answered and said to her, it hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done to thy mother-in-law since the day of thine husband, uh, since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity and art come to a people which thou knewest not heretofore. <clears throat> Boaz appreciates deeply what Ruth has done. Ruth's faith, Ruth's standing with her mother-in-law. Notice it, 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 it has been fully told me. You see, that's one of the dynamics of a small town community, small town life. Everybody knows everybody else's business. And so, uh, of course, remember when she, they arrived in Bethlehem, uh, it tells us that, that the whole town was moved. <laughs> the city was moved. And, and so it's, it's come to his attention. He's heard about Ruth and her devotion to Naomi. It had been noticed he was aware just what she meant to Naomi and knew all that she had done for her mother-in-law since the death of Marlon. She'd known, you know, it's interesting because her husband, her own husband had died and it would have been easy for her to just kind of wallow in self-pity and, and be preoccupied with self. But instead of indulging in that, she had devoted herself to the care of Naomi. And this had come to Boaz's attention. For Naomi's sake, she had left her parents, she had left the land of her birth to come to a country and a people she did not know. And so he, he recognizes this, recognizes all that she'd done and recognizes her testimony. In verse 12, the Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust the lord give you a full reward from the god of israel what encouragement this must have been to ruth to hear this from boaz and you convert to the god of israel and she's a real picture of of a true convert she she's put a trust in the God of Israel. She has left her for, former associates. She had come in among strangers. She had found protection under the wings of God. And so isn't it wonderful to think of that, that many of us, that's our story. Uh, we, we have, like her, we've left behind our former associates. We've come in among strangers, but be made welcome. We've got a new family now. She was very low in her own eyes. And again, it's a humbling thing, isn't it? To come to the, the end of self and to trust alone in the Lord for protection and rest under the shadow of his wings. Just, uh, just for the last uh, couple of minutes, let's just think a little bit about this imagery of trusting under whose wings thou art come to trust. Just a few scriptures, uh, Psalms and verse 17, chapter 17, because it's a very fam familiar theme in the scriptures, and it's a lovely picture that the Lord paints. Psalm 17, verse 8, keep me as the apple of thy eye, hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Psalm 36 and verse 7. Psalm 36, verse 7, how excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Psalm 63, and verse 7, Psalm 63, verse 7. Because thou hast been my help, 
therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. And the picture is like a tiny bird snuggling under the wings of a foster mother, getting protection. And did not the greater son of David use that same language as he looked over Jerusalem and lamented? He says, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. I would, but you would not. But isn't it wonderful for those of us that are under his protection, under the shadow of the Almighty, resting under the shadow of his wings? Isn't it wonderful that we've been brought as strangers into the field of Boaz, where we can glean, where we can find refreshment and protection and companionship, and the very wonder of wonders that Boaz would take notice of someone like us. May God encourage us with these thoughts this morning. Amen.